We live in a time of busyness. It seems that we always have something to do and somewhere to be. No matter who you are or how old you are, it feels as if we're all caught up with something. When I was in college, I found out that whether I took six classes a semester or only three, I was still somehow darting around, always being late for something, not having any free time or being able to relax. This even affects kids in high school and younger. In Finley, I had the privilege of hearing from a seventh grader how, between sports and school, he was already starting to feel overwhelmed with no free time. I realize it's not an age or a generational problem. It's a societal and cultural issue. But what are the consequences of this? What could be so bad about just giving yourself something to do? After all, the saying goes, idle hands are the devil's playthings. However, are we making ourselves so busy that we don't have time to be happy? What I mean is, when we are dealing with our day-to-day lives, when it starts to get rough or busy, does it become difficult for us to find enjoyment, to rejoice? Before I go any further, I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to be saying. I'm not going to be simply saying, well, just quit your job, then you'll have a lot more time on your hands. Mainly because, with our current state of mind, we would still find ourselves without free time because we would be filling it with chores or jobs or other activities. I'm not going to tell you to start cutting people out of your life, to stop visiting your in-laws, although I can't say that if you really want me to. (laughs) But it's family and friends that we shouldn't disregard. Instead, I want us to find reasonable ways to manage our hectic schedules as we explore why we have problems rejoicing in an effort to regain the ability to set aside time to have joy. I've often found that we tell ourselves that we're not supposed to enjoy ourselves on earth. It's a sin to enjoy ourselves on earth simply because we don't have the time. This mentality that we are always on the clock, always working, always pushing ourselves, and starting to believe that the only way to be a quote-unquote true Christian is to be constantly working and suffering because of it. The problem with this idea is that when we obsess over the future and work ourselves to the point of exhaustion, we fail to see the beauty God has set before us. And what better example do we have of someone who took the time to enjoy the little things than Jesus himself? Because Jesus did enjoy himself. When we think of his life on earth, we usually focus on only two points, his lowly birth in a manger and the painful, excruciating hours leading up to his gruesome crucifixion and death. But when we do that, we overlook some moments he had where I would argue that Jesus was enjoying his time with the disciples and enjoying himself on earth. He didn't just become born and then immediately die on the cross. He spent about 33 years on earth. So turn your Bibles, if you brought them, with you to John chapter 2, starting at the first verse. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wines after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Oftentimes when we read this, we kind of focus on the aspect that a miracle was performed, that Jesus turned water into wine. But we overlook a factor. Jesus was at a wedding, where there were lots of drinking and having fun. Not only that, but he made more wine for the guests. Saying that there were six stone jars filled to the brim, 
uh, 20 to 30 gallons means it's between 120 to 180 gallons. It seems like such a trivial thing compared to healing the blind, raising people from the dead, or calming a storm. But yet, he chose this to give as his first sign, just as the first 11 states. And I think this passage shows us that Jesus didn't brood in a desert, but he had fun. He ate, he drank, he laughed, and he reclined among us. Jesus had the most important task ever bestowed, and even he had time for joy and fun. So what's our excuse? God and Jesus both admit that our lives are going to be rough, but that doesn't mean that we have to make it any worse upon ourselves. In psychology, when we are upset or overwhelmed, we seem to cause us to feel like we're not in control of our lives. And when this happens, we obsess over certain aspects of our lives in an effort to feel some sort of control. This results in cases such as OCD or obsessive compulsory disorder and eating disorders, or what I believe, an obsession over our own schedules. The biggest problem we as Christians do is when we start to incorporate this obsession over being busy as a part of our Christian culture, giving people an incorrect image of what being a Christ follower is. Remember what Ecclesiastes 3, 12 through 13 say. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. This wasn't said by any person off the street, but was said by the wisest man who had ever lived, Solomon. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit that I've been prone to having this mentality of putting work before fun and believing that it is important and core of the Christian lifestyle to always be busy. Uh, Sometimes when I was at church up in Finley, instead of paying attention to the message of the day, my mind would be at five places at once. I was thinking about what I'd be having for lunch, what I had planned for the rest of the day, when the service would be over, or come up with future sermon ideas for myself. So no, you're not alone. (laughs) So instead of hearing the message being told that I probably needed to hear, I was already thinking about what would be happening after. We have trouble finding joy in today because we are worried about tomorrow. How can we have ice cream today when we have rent due in two weeks? How can we celebrate a holiday when we have a car in the shop? How can we relax when there is so much to prepare for? Busyness becomes a mask for worry. And I want to read to you Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you go by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So one way to combat the worry and our crammed schedules is by taking it one day at a time. Stop obsessing so much on tomorrow, which has enough worry, and focus on today. Not only that, but there is a time for everything. Yes, there is a time for mourning, but there is also a time for dancing, a time to laugh and a time to cry, a time to live and a time to die. I'm not discounting the times that we need to busy ourselves. After all, we can't just lounge around all day. However, there has to be a balance. We have to allow time to rejoice in our Creator and what He created. 
So for every hour you spend working, try to take just a few minutes for a quick prayer or something that will relax you, whether it's a crossword or Sudoku, watching a TV episode or something. That way you'll be more rested and more productive when you do go back to work. There's a story I wanted to tell you about of a book I used to read when I was younger. How many of you have heard of or ever read the book The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Jester? It is one of my favorite novels, and it's reminiscent of Wizard of Oz and Chronicles of Narnia, and it's chock full of messages. My favorite part is when the protagonist, Milo, is in this foreign land and is being led by someone who's acting as a guide. The guide leads him to a magnificent city that leaves Milo awestruck. However, the guide is quick to point out that the city is called Illusions and is really a mirage. Its twin city, Reality, is where they are really at, and it is a withered old town. The guide explains that Reality used to be as vibrant as Illusions, but the townspeople believe that things would be much better if they went everywhere as quickly as they could from point A to point B meaning they wouldn't enjoy the scenery around them. Because of this mentality, the city of reality decayed. That could be our lives. When we are so caught up with completing whatever task we have on our plate, whenever we're obsessed with going from point A to point B as quickly as possible, we fail to see the beauty that would otherwise be seen if we just slow down. There's that common phrase, stop to smell the roses, But how many of us even know what they look like? How many of us are so enamored with getting things done that we fail to find the little things in life worth rejoicing? I want to conclude with rereading Ecclesiastes 3, 10 through 13. I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Why spurn a gift from God? Accept it and rejoice that we have a God that wants us to be happy, not just for tomorrow, but for today. Remember that God made this world for us to enjoy, not just to toil over. Slow down, smell the roses, and rejoice. And all of God's people said,